Okay, the recording is on. So Lars will give his short course now, and he wants to start with actually telling something about the web resources. Yeah, course logistics, I would say. So first, welcome everyone for, for this course. I'm really excited to talk about generative modeling, which is um, yeah a new topic, at least for me, that I, own, I mean, kind of learned about over the last good, better half of a year uh, and a bit more, um, together also with a few students and collaborators, um, got into this quite a lot. Um, and I thought it would be a great topic for like students, postdocs uh, from the, I think I expect more like a mathematical audience that is interested in, in these deep learning um, techniques, but maybe also some computer scientists here, I think is a topic really to know about. So that's why I chose this. Um, I've made a, short, a small website for, for this class. Um, you can find it hopefully when you can click the link, maybe someone gives me a thumbs up if they actually got, got there as well. Um, and if you scroll down to the very end, you can see here a link to my lecture slides. Um, and I assume this link is working, otherwise I would have heard a complaint by now. And then, so that's a new part that I've, I've tried, um, or I'm going to try with you. Um, I want to split the time uh, between lecturing, not so much lecturing, and much more discussion slash experiments. So in order to enable you guys to do some of these experiments on your own, um, hopefully you won't be too distracted and only do the experiments and not listen to me anymore. That's the biggest risk I'm, I'm seeing here. Um, but what I've done is uh, you see five experiments here and you can click, for example, on one. So they're on GitHub. But what's really cool and one thing in machine learning, sometimes we think about reproducibility when we share our codes. Um, they are only reproducible if you also give people some hardware typically. Um, so the nice thing these days is um, Google Colab. Uh, uh, not that I endorse Google so much, but um, they actually did a great job in putting toge together a website called Colab. So in those notebooks, uh, you can see this link here, open in Colab, this badge. Um, and if you click on that, then it'll actually give you an executable um, um, yeah, notebook where we're going to talk about a bit more. The, the experiments will make more sense after you've seen the respective slides, but you can run this online in the cloud. Um, for the later part, we will talk about some image um, generation. You can actually get a GPU for free here as well and, and run it there uh, so more or less in real time. So the experiments, I kind of tuned them so that they don't give like perfect results that you can publish, but uh, that they run in a, in a few minutes. So two, three minutes or so um, on Colab. Which will depend, though. Um, I kind of um, on the generous side. For me, I paid like a subscription so that I can get a bit faster GPUs uh, than the basic version. So I could only time the the pro version. Um, yeah, I know it's very decadent, um, but um, that's kind of um, what. So that's kind of what I what I've prepared. You can find all these things now linked here. Um, but um, I would suggest we first talk about what's in those notebooks. Uh, so do a little bit of, of, of math first, interrupt me anytime. I mean, I'm, I'm here for you. Um, I'm hoping that was a plan to only lecture around. So basically every hour we are going to reset the clock and um, start with a little bit more lecturing. I have three topics I want to go through um, with you. Um, and hopefully only let only lecture for like 20 minutes or so. But we're already 10 minutes in, so we'll see how much how much time we have. And then, you know, things are flexible. And I also want to give people breaks in between. That's, I think, uh, the other thing with being on Zoom, we need we need a few breaks. Okay, sounds good. Questions about logistics? Good. Jump right into it. Okay, so um, deep general morning. So I, I, I kind of skip over all the um, motivation applications and so on today. And I really want to talk about the math. Uh, we've all heard about um, deep fakes, um, but also some science applications of, of generative modeling. It is a very intriguing uh, sort of problem, as you will see. Um, okay, so let's jump right into it and then think about the problem in a mathematical setting. Um, so the the, the idea in generative modeling is, or, or the goal, you have a few samples, x1 through x2 and so on, and they could be infinite many samples, like in the first two examples we're going to uh, go through, we will actually be able to create as much training data as we like. But of course, in reality, um, you can think about also some cases where you only have a small data set. 
um, and anything in between, like uh, images on the internet, for example, I would also count as infinite because there's probably more than you can that you can than you can handle. But it doesn't I mean right now it doesn't matter. We want to keep both things open. So what you're really after is so you can kind of get the get the images um, for free. But what you are interested in is learning something about the distribution of images. So you have samples, and you want to learn the distribution. In general, the distribution will be high dimensional and will be intractable. So it's not like you can write this down as a simple Gaussian. Um, I mean, you may think about it this way, but you won't get very far with this. Um, so that's really the, the idea how I view generative modeling. So the challenges are n is large and, and uh, x is complicated. So think multimodal disjoint support, um, uh, sometimes even supported in lower dimension manifold, which we call the intrinsic dimensionality of the data set it can be really nasty. You don't have any knowledge about this a priori. So the idea is, can we learn this? And the way kind of to, to learn the distribution uh, in generative model modeling, the core idea is um, that you learn how to generate samples from that distribution yourself. Um, and mathematically, what this means is you have a generator, we'll call it G, and this theta here indicates that it depends on some weight parameters. And guess what? In deep generative modeling, G will be a, a neural network and theta will be the, the weights. And so you take a vector from RQ, we'll talk about that in a second, and you generate points in Rn that hopefully look similar to the original data points you are given. Um, and this um, space RQ, you have a different distribution here that we'll call Z throughout the, the course that is so-called the latent distribution. Um, it's um, notable. So the Q here can be different from N. We'll have two cases, either it's the same or it's different, typically much lower um, than, or smaller than N. Um, and it's important to say that the latent distribution should be something easy, easy to evaluate. Because if that's the case, then you can use the generator in two ways. Uh, you can use it for density estimation. So the probability of a point X, you don't know because you just have are given some samples, but you could approximate it which some, with something I would uh, denote as a P theta because it uses a generator um, through the following integral. So you sample basically points from the, uh, you have an expectation with respect to Z. And then here you have the likelihood term. So how likely would it be that X was generated by applying Z to G? So uh, I, I can write this down. So, so you take basically here, for example, you have X minus G theta of Z as a likelihood term. And then you know, X minus so and so. So you measure kind of the similarity between the generated samples and take an expectation over that. That would in principle allow you to do this density estimation. It's a high dimensional integral still, or can be complicated because I mean, how do you discretize this? That's a different story. But in principle, you could use the generator for that. And um, the main use we're going to talk about today is the sampling. So how do I sample now? Um, I basically pick a point from Z, a sample from uh, and Z today, by the way, will just be a standard Gaussian. So it's uh, just a random function in whatever you code in and you throw it into the generator and that would give you uh, a sample from the distribution if you if we are successful in training g that's going to be the biggest mission of course okay so that is the two use cases um today really solidly the focus will be on sampling because that's what um in generative modeling people care about mostly that's the generation of new samples okay um so far so good yeah okay see a few thumbs up great um that's, a, that's kind of the short description of the problem we're, we're going to face. I want to kind of put this into a picture first. Um, so in some sense, uh, and I know visualization can become really tricky. Um, what you can think about happening here is that you have a really nice latent space Z um, because that is just a standard Gaussian, you know, you know exactly how the samples will be, will be, um, will be lying around. And you are given this nasty uh, non-convex uh, distribution X here. I should have made this even more nasty. You could think about this being actually disjoint in their support. So there's some samples here, some samples in the other hand and the other side of the corner. Um, who knows that could even be in here, maybe on a one-dimensional curve or so that would make the problem even more tricky. 
Um, that's a difficult distribution that you want to learn based on some points you have. And uh, what you kind of can think about is you can think about taking Z. And when I write G theta of Z, what I really mean is you kind of push forward the whole distribution to a different space. So you take all the samples from Z and throw the generator or throw them into the generator to get a new, also really complicated distribution. And the core difficulty here is the learning, right? We want to learn the weights theta. And in order to do this, guess what? We need some sort of a loss function and some optimization. And the loss function here should be based on how close we are here. But uh, this begs the, the biggest question that we're going to face today. How do you compare the similarity between these uh, distributions? And should you compare those uh, similarities here? Or are there other ways to avoid this? Because this problem here, to find out how close you are, is going to be tremendously difficult because um, you will have to consider probably if you want to do a great job, the entire data set of X here, then you'll have a bunch of samples over here, but you will have no correspondence because um, the points, you don't know that the first sample from here will be mapping to the first data point. You think about the, this in a distribution level. So that is going to be a key issue in the whole field that uh, I'm going to show you three ways, three different ways how to how to tackle that. Okay. Are, are you going to use divergence, KL divergence? We are going to use a KL divergence that I'll kind of define really briefly how, how that goes. And we'll also totally avoid uh, divergence like that. So that's more, so we'll cover the whole spectrum. Uh, I want to cover three main approaches basically in this field that I see. But let's look at a few things that we can do here. So the first thing is really a toy example that um, we can play very easily with on, on, on the Google Colab. And the idea is, so here's your, here's your data. So it's a, like, I would say still it's a complex distribution. I mean, if I ask you, um, I compute the density of a point in here, um, that would, be a trim, would, would not be an easy pa um, um, part for you. And also if I ask you to generate more samples, you would, I think, have to understand really how, how we got to this point. Probably we sampled from a Gaussian and did some uh, transformation, but we don't know the generation. Okay, that's something with a black box to us. Um, so here, uh, what I want to do is I want to use a two-dimensional latent space and take uh, these red samples will be the samples from the Gaussian. Um, we talked about this direction, the generation phase. Um, um, if I transform all these samples, I should make it so that half of them maybe lie on top and the other half lie here. And then I've done a great job. Also, in this case, um, what I'm actually going to use for the first part of the course, which tremendously simplifies uh, the training, is let's assume we have an inverse. Because if we had an inverse, we could actually also take these blue points back in here and see how they sort of how Gaussian they are. And that will be the first training algorithm that we're going to use. Okay, so that's a trick I can I can use. Will will be much simpler um, in terms of in terms of the computation here. Uh, but I also want to talk about a more realistic and probably more interesting case for you is uh, how to generate images. So here, um, this trick of using the inverse will not work very well because, um, so say what we are actually going to do is we are going to use the same latent space twice, but once we are generating these, these moons data set, it's called, and the other, times, the other time we want to generate uh, handwritten digits. That's a famous MNIST data set that I think everyone has seen. So here now think about this. So you take uh, two numbers that you sample in, in this latent space, but, then, but I'm asking you to create 784 numbers. So uh, clearly this uh, generator will not be invertible. And that's where things become a little bit more hairy and, uh, and also more interesting actually, to be honest. Um, we can also think about, um, I want to talk about this right now, is that um, uh, the intrinsic dimensionality of the data set is a term that you always read in this, in this, in this business. What it sort of means is that you want to find out uh, if the data lives on a lower dimensional manifold or does it have a volume even? Is there a well-defined density in the space that you are, the, that the data is given? And that doesn't of course have to correlate to the dimension of the vector space. So in, in this case here, for example, you could say, yeah, there is maybe, I mean, they, they seem to lie on two curves, but at least there is some width to the curve that they would actually have a volume in 2D. So the intrinsic dimensionality I would define as two. 
if I ask you, so what's the dim intrinsic dimensionality of the MNIST data down here? Um, I don't know uh, what I would get in terms of answers from you guys. Um, I think the only unacceptable answer that would make you fail your midterm today, remember, is if you gave me 784, because that's clearly not the dimension. No. Yes, no. welcome. It would, <laughs> I mean, in a way, representing an image as a lined up vector of pixels in a very high dimensional space, you disrupt all neighborhood information. Operating. Of course, that comes on top of it. But that's it's actually cool. not that the most. That to me is initially a stupid step, but it seems to be the totally accepted thing in this whole business. Is is that true? Um, when without, at the very beginning, when people use SVD to to do, I mean, this was kind of a big impediment. Now, yeah. is the network business so miraculously better to to make up for this for this giving away a lot of information? Because um, usually you are looking at a two-dimensional function, a function of two variables. If you look at the grayscales as a piecewise constant, it's a function of two variables. Um, and, and you, you represent it in, in R784. So this is... Yes. I, I'm just wondering whether philosophically from the very beginning, this is a clever thing to do, which you then have to... Less Sorry. <clears throat> See what I mean? So in the code, what we will actually uh, to, to make you happy, but also that's the way actually the problem works in the end, is we are going to keep actually with uh, 28 by 28 images here, like discrete images. And you keep the, it's very important actually to, to, to keep the neighborhood information because guess what? The generator here will be what's called a convolutional neural network yeah, you um, make and so on, okay? Um, but uh, for, for me, it's sometimes when I put these things on slides, they're, they're meaning okay. the same. You can reshape them any way you like. It's important to keep it, of course. Um, right. um, but that's a great point. Anyway, um, how do I know that the dimensionality of the data set is not equal to 784? Look at the top left pixel in all the em MNIST images, and it's going to be zero. So I can remove that pixel for, for all the images. It doesn't give me any, any information. And uh, then I can think I can take it down and uh, take one more off. How do I know it's two? That's a good question. Uh, maybe you're not convinced by now that we can generate good images, but uh, or basically kind of um, represent all the information in the MNIST images in 2D, and that would be great because I need a few, I need a critical audience. But um, I'm also going to give you these um, examples. You can crunch numbers on your own to see that we will actually come close. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, I have a yeah. question. Um, sure. you have this example there with the numbers, uh, this is more of a general question, but can you put this into context why we want to generate these images or the, yeah. these samples? Why do we want to generate them? Um, okay, short answer, because I said I, I kind of don't want to talk about all the applications of, of deep generative modeling. Um, think about what... My, for example, I mean, like generating samples from complicated distributions is a core problem in, in statistics. So think about Bayesian statistics, Bayesian inverse problems, um, knowing the dense, I mean, for example, um, if you want to learn, I don't know what people, what application, sorry, I missed the, the introductions this morning. But uh, so for example, if some of you are interested in, um, I mean, this is models and data. So if you want to calibrate your model with data, typically you need prior information. So say I have a bunch of um, an MRI, MRI images of, of the human brain around and I want to get a better reconstruction. I mean, I can go with, of course, total variation and all these mathematically derived um, priors, but they are, these are unimodal priors, which I don't think is uh, really what's going on in, in brain images as people I think will fall into different categories here. So if I have the power of generating samples from my distribution. I've basically learned the distribution because also as I showed on the previous slide, I can uh, quantify densities in some sense and all that. So uh, there is an incredibly powerful um, um, framework to have. Um, I will say, you know, the commercial applications, of course, you've seen um, you know, deep fake images. Um, you have uh, probably some stigma to, to that. There are also, I, I think, pretty tremendous challenges. So HBO, for example, had, uh, had a documentary about um, LGP, LGBTQ people in Chechnya and to uh, disguise the identity of all the activists they interviewed, they used deep fakes, for example, to uh, people. In, so people in the US could lend their faces and their voices to those people 
um, and then they would generate uh, kind of new images where where the identity was totally hidden. So yeah, there are ton. I mean, let's say that, you know there are tons of applications and and reasons to do this both mathematically but also application wise. So, so for instance, in Bayesian inversion, that should be then a great hit if this is successful, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, like, but but it's also um, having said that. Um, I should have, maybe it's a good reminder to give now. This topic is not new. I mean, for decades and decades or even centuries, uh, people have been trying to come to sample from complex distributions. So maybe okay. some of you know MCMC methods, for example, yeah. our way to sample from really difficult distributions. And uh, they are uh, successful <laughs> to a great extent. Um, what we are going to do here is has, has a few benefits and of course, also a few downsides. I mean, in the sense that um, in MCMC, for example, you worry about correlation within the chain, the samples are not really IID. Here, the samples would be completely IID right away from the get-go if, if, if we were able to pull this off. Um, so yeah, it's uh, hopefully, Kristen, a uh, little bit of motivation. Thanks. And of course, you know, um, these two problems, absolutely, I cannot give you any motivation for. Like we have enough MNIST images in the world and this uh, wounds example is also not so meaningful, uh, but it is a test bed problem. If we can't solve those, there's no hope to move on. Okay, okay. great. Uh, but but this is also a very good question. So thanks for, thanks for that. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Um, again, three most popular classes of approaches. Um, it's hard to be honest to keep up with all the developments in this field, so I'm not even going to try. Um, but when you when you read the news and the papers that come out on a monthly basis and on those conferences, oftentimes you can group them into three classical approaches these days. And uh, understanding those in, in in detail, maybe we can we can establish in three hours, and then the rest is up to you guys. But I want to motivate you to look into these things more because there are really interesting questions in here. Uh, there is a main reference to this. Uh, which is a kind of a introduction paper that, that I've written recently with Eldad Haber um, uh, on this topic. Uh, you can check this out and I'm mostly going to follow that uh, template. Um, so, okay, so here are the three blocks. So the first block, which was supposed to be done by now, but it's not, um, uh, but it's okay, we, are, we can be flexible, is going to be uh, normalizing flows. The second one is a uh, variational autoencoder and the third one, Probably that's why everyone, why everyone is here. It's called generative adversarial networks. It's a, there's a huge hype around that, and we'll, we'll look a little bit under the hood um, and, and to, into that field. Okay, and they have different ways of dealing with with the problem at hand. So the first one is really the simplest one because here we construct really construct G to be a diffeomorphism. Um, and if I ask you what a diffeomorphism is, uh, maybe some people can think about it. Put it in the chat window. Um, um, then. You train it really by uh, maximum likelihood estimation is a fancy way of saying uh, you compare divergences between the distributions or uh, quantify how Gaussian the sample would be. Um, so that is really the first class. Then the variational autoencoder is more general because there you can actually have different uh, Qs and Ns, whereas here they are fixed. That's the biggest step up here. Um, so, but you, we are going, still going to use some notion of an inverse. So the, the inverse problems people will be very happy in that section. Um, and then, then we'll kind of completely go unchained and go into this GAN world where there's, there are many mysteries and uh, you kind of completely lose uh, all the nice notions of uh, comparing distributions. You're not even trying really. Um, well, that's kind of the, the outline. And again, we'll stop in between, take breaks so that you can ask questions or some of you may just want to uh, play a little bit with the examples I'm going to present and uh, we'll do a, a bit of freestyle and experimentation. Um, and if we take longer, so that was the initial plan to have a 20 minute lecture and then time for a coding discussion break and so on. Um, you know, I, I, everything is up to you guys. You can ask questions along the way, then maybe we'll be a bit uh, over time, uh, but I think we can, we can get along quite nicely. Okay, so let's look into normalizing flows and then the extension to continuous normalizing flows. Um, so here, Again, we, we are going to talk about this data set only, not MNIST, okay? Because in MNIST, I cannot really make the case that I should use a diffeomorphic mapping. And since uh, no one has responded uh, to a soft call for action here or for a response, what is a diffeomorphism? It's a kind of a, a, a function that is invertible and both the function and the inverse is smooth. Um, whatever smooth means for us, uh, think about C1 or so. Um, 
But here I can make the case. I can try. Um, probably I can. I cannot even convince you to make the case here, right? I mean, I'm already com committing a crime because you see that you have something that has a continuous support here on the left, and you are going to split it into two. So let's see how much we'll pay for this, or if we are going to pay for it. I, th I think um, the answer is clear uh, that we will pay, but not not clear how much. So if that's the case, and then here's what I'm going to do, really. So I'm going to. So now I can estimate the likelihood of a sample X. So you give me X, any any point, any blue point. Um, I can approximate its likelihood through um, the generator, or better said, the inverse of the generator. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to map G, uh, sorry, X over to the red space here, like this one. Um, and then I'm going to plug this. So this P here um, should actually, let me, let me clarify that, should actually be a PZ. So I, I map it over to the latent space, and then I can use the latent distribution to um, quantify the, uh, the density. And in order to do this correctly, I need to not only evaluate the density, but I also need to worry about the volume change. So the determinant of the Jacobian is a volume change by the transformation. Think about uh, calculus uh, one, two, three, probably three, uh, where you have a change of variable formula. That's where the Jacobi determinant comes into play. Okay, so in our case for the Gaussian, this is uh, this uh, nice little formula here that we have. And it's uh, quite tractable actually uh, to evaluate if you find a good way to compute the inverse and compute the Jacobi determinant. Okay. Um, Gabe is already laughing. Um, I, I'm going to show you two ways how you can do this. Okay, uh, and that should be then uh, approved by induction almost. But um, but that's kind of the, the the name of the game here. The nice thing is that now I can kind of choose the weights um, theta, so that the samples that I have get a max, get really high likelihood. What what you can think about happening here is you can think about uh, taking this Gaussian and pushing it so that most of the yellow stuff, which is high density, is aligned with my samples. That's the other way how you can, how you can look at this. Um, and if, I, if I'm able to do this, probably I have a good uh, generator. So let's see how, how that goes. Um, okay. Um, so we call it maximum likelihood training because it, it is really what it is. Um, and um, you will believe me that I can minimize the negative log of the likelihood uh, instead of maximizing the likelihood itself. So uh, probably a good idea. So then what we'll have is, so we have an expected value here um, where the samples are drawn from X. Again, we cannot draw samples from X, but we are given plenty, so let's, let's assume. So what I can do is I can even downsample, like if I want to say S points, I just pick randomly chosen samples here. And I approximate the expected value with Monte Carlo. Uh, so one over S times the sum of everything. And in here, um, you know, I've taken the log what, from what we've seen on the previous slide. And uh, I've put in a C here because I don't want to deal with normalization constants too much. That will not affect my optimization anyway. Okay. Um, so this objective function is what I'm going to minimize here uh, with respect to theta. Uh, so now Wolfgang's question, if you do this, you can actually show that uh, this problem is equivalent to minimizing the KL divergence between the distribution you don't know and the distribution you kind of your generator is implying. Um, and why is that? So if we wrote this out, so the KL divergence between uh, PX and P theta, um, I can write as so, correct? That's um, the standard definition of the KL divergence. And now you can think about this as an expected value. So you take this part here, and treat it as the expected value. And this is what you get. So you have the log of the ratio between Px and P theta. Uh, you apply the roots of the log that gives you a, a log Px minus log P theta. And then you realize that you're interested in finding theta and theta will not affect this term up here. So it's going to be just a constant. You drop the constant and you're done. Okay, so um, basically, you can think about this as um, maximizing the, the likelihood. I, I prefer this name because it's more honest um, in the sense that what I'm measuring is actually the likelihood, uh, but you can also uh, think it's the same as minimizing the KL divergence between, uh, between the two distributions, okay? Um, so that's, I would say, a pretty solid framework. If we can answer the big question and the elephant in the room is how to get G, what, what to do about G. Um, 
Yeah, so the, and you note actually something funny. So the training needs G inverse and it's log determinant, but what you care about in the end is, is, is G itself. So that may uh, give you a few ways to also trade off um, some of the computational aspects of this problem. Um, okay, so the first one is what's called a normalizing flow. Um, it's mathematically, it's, it's sort of a simple idea actually. So what you do is you, and say you have a fixed, oh, sorry, that's supposed to be a, a Z that you sample from the latent distribution. And what I can do is I can define um, the, the generator as a concatenation of a bunch of functions. Doesn't quite buy me anything for now, but uh, if I now think about these functions being incredibly simple and simple meaning that I can invert them and I can get their uh, Jacobi determinant, then I'm, then I'm in business. So if I denote all the hidden features by Ys, I need a few, little bit of notation here, unfortunately, then the inverse, I mean, it's just um, kind of reversing the order and taking the individual inverses. And the log determinant is a sum. Uh, and also uh, denote this here, typically you would sum it backward, but of course it doesn't matter which way you go. And you have the individual log determinants of all, all these functions. I'm going to call these functions a layoff function because I think about this as a K layer neural network. If you can uh, give me these um, two properties for every layer, then you're good to go. Okay. Um, Excuse me. So yes. can I ask? So so now your theta is your parameter is somehow hidden in this. Oh. Fk is yes. split into the different fk. Yeah. Great point. There's so theta one, theta k. I don't know. <laughs> yes. So here's now the the machine learning person and me shining through. Um, we have to get used to the fact that a few things will be swept under the rug in the notation to just keep them brief mm -hmm. in some sense. But yeah, theta is going to be really my joker. Theta can collect anything that you need okay. to parameterize the generator. Okay. So in this case, probably we can think about having a theta one through theta k to belong to the different Fs. And in those different Fs, you could even sure. think about those being divided into some matrices that you multiply with, convolution stencils, uh, bias terms, um, all sorts of animals. I don't, we don't, for, for the good news is for today, we don't really want, need to deal with this too much. But yeah, that's a great point. So all the parameters are, are hidden in there. Uh, one thing I should say then also, so those layers don't have, have to be, have to have the same structure. They could of course be completely different in, in nature. I mean, typically that's not how you set these things up. You have basically a similar structure that you use K times over, but um, can be rather general. So, but yeah, this is a great question, Albert. So thanks, thanks for that. So Lars, when, to keep these guys invertible, what are you using? A resonance? Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh, you're two slides ahead. Uh, I'll get there. I see. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> Um, so here's a trade-off we're facing first. So let's uh, reflect a little bit of what we what we want to do. So we want, of course, um, I want almost no restrictions on F, okay? Because I want to be super expressible. Um, and in general, I will need this to have complicated data sets. On the other hand, I need uh, to keep track of tractability because um, in the end of the day, you know, if I need to, an iterative method to invert all of these guys, maybe I'm not really gaining too much with this framework. So, so Wolfgang's question is, is definitely fair, fair to say. I see basically three kinds of work and there's an incomplete uh, list of some references you, you, may, you may be interested in looking into. Um, and there are a few cases. So we are going to be in, moving in this regime where we really want to have both of these operations being efficient and actually include the log determinant as well. Uh, all of these have to be efficient for today. Um, and there are two examples. We are going to look at this, what's called real NVP, um, yeah, real non-volume preserving flow. Okay, that's that's uh, that's a real real name. We'll look at this in a little bit how to construct this. Um, then there are some where you have an efficient generator, but you don't know the inverse. So there you have to wave your hands a little bit in the training. Um, it'll make more sense that you could even do this after we talked about variational autoencoders because they also don't use explicit inverses. Um, and then you have the other one. Uh, this is supposed. This is actually quite simple in the sense that the training will be fast because you have a G inverse. But then uh, sometimes, by inefficient we mean it's not impossible to to evaluate G of theta. It's, it's tractable, but uh, think about uh, something that is uh, not parallelizable. So you can basically parallelize the inverse, but you cannot parallelize forward. And then we know that the whole uh, name of the game is to use the GPU for everything, and that's that's a trouble. Okay. 
Um, so anyway, these are for the reference. Today we only talk about this one example because we have so many other things to go through. Okay, so Wolfgang, here's what we do. Um, so let's go. Let's go in a little bit, uh, a little bit slow here because there's some notation here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the JF layer of of this and tell you then how to do the other layers. And I'm going to assume that we only have two dimensions, like we have in our example. More dimensions is just more, more pain in notation. So what you do is you have your input, let's call it yj, um, and you, come, you can look at y1j and y2j, or yj1, yj2. And the name of the game is you keep one constant. So in this case, let's say we keep y1 constant, and Y2, you transform affinely, but the affine transformation depends non-linearly on Y1. So this part here is going to be one neural network. And this part here is going to be another neural network that takes only Y1 as an input. And that now can be any neural network that goes from R to R or any function really, uh, because neural networks are just function approximated. Pick anything you like. So. Sure. Are you, are you anticipating already the log? Because under the log, you would get a resonance structure, right? Um, I, I won't get a resonance structure, Wolfgang, because you don't have, so note that the Y2 here doesn't, doesn't appear only once. Ah, mm -hmm. okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah, important. Right. That's right. important for the invertibility. Yeah. Um, but basically what you have is, so the nonlinear function that um, I mean, in a fine function you can easily invert, right? Especially in one D. Um, so when you go backward, um, when you're given y one, you can uh, compute y two. But when you're given y two, I can give you y one also. Then so backward. you are also giving up on that strict framework of say affine transformation followed by an activation function. Um, no, I'm not giving up on this, but I'm hiding this all. In, in these ones. So that's uh -huh. you know, your first neural network. Or, and that is this one here is going to be a second neural network. So you have two neural networks here that you're that you're training. And those you know will have activation functions, nonlinearities, resnets, multilayer perceptron, name it. It doesn't it doesn't matter for this for the purpose we have uh, to generate and to invert. Doesn't matter. Um, okay. Um, so, so that's basically one example how to construct these type of approaches. So, um, yeah, and then that's, a, that's a part of your midterm. So the log determinant and the inverse are trivial. That's a claim, and uh, you can tr you can uh, try it. Um, but you can already see that to make this really expressive, um, you may uh, need a few layers. Um, uh, can you can think, yeah, Albert. Can I ask a question? It seems to me that in this in this example. Uh, you're only transforming essentially the second. Mm. So you're going to, oh, yeah. to maintain the marginal distribution yes. of the first component constant. You're not going to be able to shape it sure, in sure. any way. Uh, right? I, should, I should have here one more thing. Um, so but maybe it's a, al a alternate. Play, yeah. I thought your next uh, row of okay okay then, one. Then, then that's and then that works y2. yeah i agree oh sorry so i did yeah uh, no no my fault I, I should have written this down but yeah so you can alternate you can not alternate sure, then, but then, at some point then, you have to do something about y1 otherwise i'm not to going to get the job done of course yeah okay yeah Thank great you. thanks for paying attention here and pointing this out yeah so of course you need to alternate that but you can think about what would you do in high dimensions in high dimensions this approach i mean uh, we can first of all say we can generalize it so you can block them, you can group them into two components in, in the vector space. Um, because what you really need is you want to have some triangular, uh, triangular structure in the Jacobians yeah. here to do everything. Okay, but in order to really take care of all the possible ways that the data set could be coupled, you will need quite a few layers here. Thank yeah. You. But in two dimensions, uh, you'll see, I mean, that this, this stuff is eating, eat, really eating many things alive. Okay, um, and it's you know a simple idea I can write down on a slide. Uh, I can write. Uh, I mean, I gave you the code. Uh, we can read everything of this code. It's not a it's not a difficult part to to do actually. Uh, and of course, I'm not the first one programming this, and uh, definitely definitely not. Um, okay, so here's something you can do. Um, I mentioned already this this notebook um, that you can play with um, in, in a little bit when we take at least a little bit of a break. Um, 
but you can see kind of nicely here. So here kind of I denote the hidden features. I always like to look at the hidden features where usually machine learning people don't look at. Um, you see this coordinate wise movement. So you take a red point and then you kind of update them um, always only into one direction. And if you think, I mean, Wu Chen is now here. If you think about an optimal transport between these two densities, this is clearly not going to be very optimal because they, they I mean, they're getting the job done. Uh, so what you can see here is, as I said in the beginning, you want to push forward the Gaussians that it overlaps with the samples. So that mission I think is completed. Um, and um, these, by the way, are also generated samples. So the, the blue dots here are, not, are fake, sort of say fake points. Um, they lie where they are supposed to, to, to lie based on the training data. And it's also interesting, I think, here to look at the inverse. And let's take a, take a peek at the inverse like, real quick. Um, so here I'm taking the data points, the, the red points now are data points transferred back by the inverse of the generator. And they could have been Gaussian. I mean, they're not perfectly Gaussian. And to show that, I've basically done a histogram um, of, of many, many samples in the background. And uh, do you see this uh, ridge here? Yeah. This is uh, basically the discontinuity that is biting us here. You can actually see it shine through. Because remember, we still committed a crime, namely assuming that there's a diffeomorphic mapping. But all in all, I mean, the price we paid here was, was not so high, I would say. So it's, it's good. And again, I mean, I, I encourage you in a little bit, you'll actually get some time to this, uh, to, to look at the notebook also. Um, so that's normalizing flows. One thing, um, I mean, I mentioned kind of optimal transport also, which of course is a very rich field. Um, and also one way to overcome this limitation and this uh, kind of finicky construction is going a different route. And that is called continuous normalizing flows where you would um, discretize the generator or uh, express a generator as a dynamical system. So think about neural ODE type of ideas now. Um, so what you do here is the G of Z, of Z is basically the terminal uh, state of this initial value problem. So you plug in Z as an initial constraint or the initial co condition. And then you solve an initial value problem where you have a V theta. And V is, think about velocity um, and subscript theta in the in index that this will depend on, on those weights theta. Um, probably theta would even change in time, I'm sweeping that under the rug for now. Um, but that's basically the idea. If we can train the velocity, then let's see if this if this satisfies our two requirements. Um, I know let's just have the results there. Um, so, how would you go about um, computing the inverse? Solving the backward equations. Yes, yeah, so you do something extremely dangerous that we tell you not to do in general. Uh, you take an x, you use it as a terminal condition, and you uh, integrate this thing backward in time, and you don't worry about stability and anything that, that can go wrong. Uh, you should check it, um, and I would make the case that you should uh, somehow regularize the velocity so that it's actually legit to do. So um, what, what I'm typically doing in practice is I'm using ideas from optimal transport to make sure that we actually get really simple trajectories that are okay to invert and that they don't cross and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's uh, something you have to keep in mind when you do this. And then there is this... Um, they actually need formulas to compute the log determinant along the way too. That will be the trace. So you compute, you integrate basically the trace of the velocity, uh, of the, sorry, the divergence of the velocity field. If you integrate that, you'll get the log determinant estimate. Um, but anyway, that's going into much detail. Uh, there's this paper written by my student um, and also this paper that talks about this. If you want to know more, you can ask me certainly. But when you do this for this example, um, so this is this OT flow notebook, you can actually see now that these um, trajectories here became a little bit more straight. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just kind of a mapping. And here, actually, one thing important to note, uh, to note is that um, basically, I, I'm not tied to a particular construction of the velocity field. Whereas this in the idea of integrating forward and backward, yeah. I'm like, you know, just from a, from a coding perspective, I can do for no matter what the structure here is. Of course, it may impede, may have implications for my stability and stuff like that. But um, well, yeah. But in principle, you know, you don't you don't need to have these um, 
yeah, you know, um, alternating structures uh, because I never need a V inverse. That's um, that's actually, you can basically use almost any network here. Of course, there's a specific way to do this. Again, in this paper, um, what, we, what we do is we use, we pull a few tricks from optimal transport to make this, uh, to narrow down the good architecture for the V. Um, Based on based on some theory, is, but, there, uh, is there a systematic way to sort of create the V? Yes, there is. Um, um, how about uh, you know, Wolfgang? Yeah, I, okay. I go to the end, and then we can we have, I can tell you all about that. Uh, okay. That's uh, literally what we spent uh, a year on to to work on, and that this has been a, a really fun project. And uh, you can see the fruits of that. In this example specifically, you can see the fruits of that. Um, okay, um, but quick discussion: normalizing flows. Um, you uh, train maximum likelihood. You need an inverse. Big limitation here that we're going to talk about next is. Uh, you need to kind of uh, deal with the non-invertibility. Oh, sorry. You need to you need to have the invertibility. So in the intrinsic dimension has to be equal to n, and you the support in principle cannot be disjoint. In principle, right? I mean, uh, and if it, and if you violate this assumption, you'll pay a price. So um, in normalizing flows, you have a trade-off between expressiveness and efficiency. In the CNFs. Um, Sometimes over two dimensions, it may be an overkill to use it, to be honest. But for higher dimensionality, you, you will typically see much better performance. Um, and uh, say hundreds, I mean, hundreds of dimensions is kind of the high dimensional game. It's not like super high, but it's also not trivial to solve an OT problem in that dimension. Um, okay, so how about like this? Um, we are way over time, but the next uh, few slides won't have introduction and so on. So we'll, we'll save time later on. And I think it was good to set up uh, the notation and discuss along the way. Um, how about we take, um, I show you kind of the two examples that, that, that we have, and you can play with this for say 15 minutes. Um, and then we have a five minute break. And uh, in the meantime, I mean, I'll be here all the time so we can uh, talk, have more questions and discussions along the way. But I don't want uh, like uh, 38 people being idle in here and uh, have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with other people. So I want to give everyone something to chew on. So if you go over to the website again, let's, let's do that. Um, and you click on any of the first two links, I would suggest since we have limited time, you pick uh, one method you like to learn more about. I think the real MVP is the one I would go for. It would, uh, I just did a test run that it actually still works. Um, it gives you uh, this notebook with a short description. Um, and I have some suggested experiments uh, because you sh I showed you this Moon's data set uh, on the slides. But uh, if you comment on this line, you can, for example, think about sampling from a uniform distribution. So, I mean, it's not a really meaningful problem, but again, you are going to sample from a uniform distribution by only sampling from a Gaussian. I think an even better experiment for you guys to do is, it's relatively easy to set it up an experiment here. You basically need to modify these three lines and you can do this because uh, that's the amazing thing with CoLab. And you can basically come up with your own distribution you wanna sample from. So you would uh, sample from something and transform it in a non-trivial way. And we can see in 15 minutes what you can come up with. Um, this one trains relatively quickly. You can also, of course, look at how the training goes as a table of content even. Um, uh, and it'll give you in the end, if, if all goes well, it gives you a, a figure that looks similar to what I showed you on the slide Question, for your example. What, what is the optimization algorithm hidden in, in yeah. behind all uh, this? I mean, uh, is this? Basically here, stochastic gradient or something. Yes. Like so here that. is the standard um, Adam and the learning rate, of course, is 10 to the negative four. What can I say? Um, again, and one, pers one purpose of giving you these, these notebooks is also if you want to kind of uh, um, play with different settings, there are a few settings um, uh, in here. So one is uh, how many layers do you want? Um, how wide should the neural networks be? Um, how, what is in the neural network is all written out here. Um, but um, I would say, you know, how about we con reconvene with lectures at 3.15, that's in 20 minutes. And in that time, you know, people can do whatever they like to do. Um, you know, take, take breaks, um, chat with me, um, 
play with these codes. Um, so there's this one, and then there's this OT flow one, which is rather similar actually, but that is now using the different transformation model under the hood. Um, and um, yeah, we can resume then in, in 20 minutes, or you can go through the slides and ask me anything. But um, I feel I've been uh, frontal for a very long time now. So I'm just going to stop here for, for a few minutes. Okay. Uh, Lars, should I stop recording or uh, you, uh, it's up to up you? To you. Yeah. Up to you. Um, yeah. Probably, how about you stop recording? Because maybe then people are more yeah. willing to discuss. Um, okay. I completely don't care, but. Yeah, but uh, it's very good. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, also great questions already along the along the way. Well, I'm sorry I have to go for, for dinner now, otherwise I'm going to be in big trouble. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> um, you are in the European time zone, so that's oh, Bobby, totally fair. No? Maybe you can 